What's going on, everyone? Let's take a look at some updates as it relates to the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. I'm recording this at 7 a.m. Central on Sunday, December 17th, 2023. For updated casualty information, you can find links in the description below to Al Jazeera, citing the Gaza Health Ministry, as well as the official statistics coming out of the Israeli Defense Forces. On Friday, information came out that Israel had killed three of their hostages in a friendly fire incident in Gaza. And I think this was a little confusing because there were two separate reports that came out at the end of last week, both talking about three hostages, the bodies of three hostages that had been recovered. So the first one, uh, late Thursday, early Friday that came out was that three young men, hostages taken by Hamas, their bodies had been discovered in Gaza and they'd been moved back into Israel. And then later in the day, Israel put out information with three additional names. So six total hostages, uh, over the period of those 24 hours, three additional names of hostages that had accidentally been shot by Israeli forces in the Gaza Strip. So the best summary that I've seen put together around this incident was, was organized by Manny Fabian. I'm going to walk through some of what he put together here. He said, one soldier stationed in a building identified three suspicious figures exiting a building several dozen meters away. All three were shirtless with one of the figures carrying a stick with a makeshift white flag. The soldier, who believed the men moving towards him, was an attempt by Hamas to lure IDF soldiers into a trap, immediately opened fire, and shouted, terrorists. He killed two of the men, while the third, who was hit and wounded, fled back into the building. They say at that stage, the commander of that unit went outside and called on his forces to cease fire. Meanwhile, they heard someone yelling, help, in Hebrew, Sounds like it was likely the, the third hostage it was hit. Uh, moments later, that third man came out of the building again. So a different soldier opened fire and killed him on the spot. The IDF commander then realized that these three men coming out of the building looked a little different than what they had previously seen in the area and discovered that all three were Israeli hostages. All three bodies were then identified and subsequently moved back into Israel. Israel says that the soldier who opened fire upon identifying the three men did so against protocols. That's not how he was supposed to operate, as did the second soldier who killed the third man who came out later from the building. Uh, the IDF, in a statement, said that they have not identified any Palestinian civilians in this area in recent days, and there have been a significant number of close-range engagements. They say the only people that they have seen wearing civilian attire in this area have been Hamas operatives moving around unarmed. What they say is that a lot of times Hamas will fire on them from a building, set down the weapons, move across the street, move through the open unarmed, so they look like civilians, move into another facility where they again open fire on Israeli forces. That is what they're presenting as what these soldiers may have been anticipating in this area. Additionally, they say that just in the past few days, these, this unit has killed at least 38 Hamas operatives in relatively close-range combat in this area. And there's been a handful of locations, again, in this area of Hamas to try to lure IDF soldiers into an ambush. They say immediately following this incident, the IDF sent out new protocols, new standard operating procedures to ground troops for the possibility that additional hostages may be trying to flee captivity. They say this scenario itself, the hostages walking around above ground in a battle zone is something that they haven't taken into consideration because they haven't seen it anywhere since the ground offensive kicked off in Gaza. A hospital is once again at the center of controversy in Gaza. Israel announced overnight that over the past few days, they've detained 90 Hamas operatives, some of whom took part in the October 7th attack at the Kamal Adwan Hospital in northern Gaza. Additionally, Israel says that in a search of the hospital, they uncovered multiple weapons, grenades, RPGs, IEDs, and other military equipment, some of which was being stored in incubators in the maternity ward. And Israel says that they questioned some of the hospital staff during this operation who admitted that they knew that weapons had been stored in some of these areas. Then there was an Al Jazeera on scene named Anas al-Sharif who uploaded a video that I'll play here briefly. Uh, this was after the raid took place. He said that, that after the operation, Israel bulldozed the area and buried alive and killed dozens of Palestinian patients that were taking shelter in and around the hospital area. And this is why I wish we just had more independent reporters on the ground or reporters from different organizations all around the world inside of Gaza. I mean, think about this. If that report 
about Israel bulldozing areas outside of a hospital and burying alive wounded Palestinians, if that was presented and filmed by an American working for the Associated Press or a Brit working for Reuters, would you have received it any differently? Would you have considered that information differently? I know at least a handful of people would have. I mean, it's just, look, we, we don't view Al Jazeera, rightfully so, as a fully impartial actor here. Now, CNN actually went into Gaza a couple days ago without an IDF escort in what they kind of presented as like the first unfiltered raw footage from Gaza, the first international reporters to go into an area on their own and kind of report what they saw. But like, honestly, nothing came out of that, really. I watched it. It was about a six-minute clip. It was heartbreaking, of course. They went to a hospital, uh, and they, they talked with children who were seriously wounded, one, one young girl who had lost her leg. Uh, and some of these kids were too young uh, to understand that their parents had been killed, and they were never going to see him again. The kids were calling out to doctors that they thought looked like their dad, not not recognizing, not able to understand yet that their parents were gone. And it, it, it's tragic, but we know all of that already, right? Like, it, it's war. It's a tragedy. These things are happening, and, and I don't want to downplay the loss, and it is important to get stories like this out there in the world so people understand what's happening, but you know, what CNN put out is not around any like hotly debated topics where somebody's going to inevitably say like, no, 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 that's fake. I don't believe that's happening. But like this bulldozer story at the hospital, you know, that's one where I think it'd be really, really valuable to have other organizations, whether it's CNN or Reuters or AP or, or any number of other reporters from around the world there to see what actually happens. Then in sticking with the hospital here, the IDF put out footage that looked a little off, if I'm being honest. So I'm not going to share, again, I don't share videos and footage of captives, hostages, anything like that. Here you can find these readily available on the internet. But there were, were pictures, and you've probably seen these at this point, of what they say were Hamas militants moving in line kind of through custody with holding their weapons overhead, AK-47s overhead, and they were shirtless. Now, the taking off of the shirts is a technique to ensure that they're not wearing suicide vests. It's a method. It's not necessarily what I learned in the military to do. It's not a tactic we use in Afghanistan to like, you know, take the clothes off of people that we thought might have suicide vests on, but it is one way to do that. So you're not going to nitpick that. It's very surprising though, to see captives holding their weapons. Normally you just, you want that weapon like as far away from the militant as possible, as soon as possible, right? So Overall, I do think that the claims, and you'll see this in the internet, that people think that everything IDF does is staged and fake. I think that's a little bit overblown, a lot a bit overblown. But these pictures just don't feel right. I mean, these very well might be Hamas operatives, every single one of them, but it's hard to come up with a reason why you allow the militants that were fighting you to pick up and carry their weapons after they were captured. I mean, there's a lot of potential downsides to doing this. The only upside that I can think of uh, kind of puts this in the PR realm. When you have, because Hamas does not wear uniforms, if you just have a group of Palestinian men, which is what they would look like, walking outside in captivity, it, it would be easy for people around the world to say, look at those innocent civilians that are being detained. The minute that they're carrying a weapon, all of a sudden it looks, at first glance, like, well, these must be fighters. These must be militants. Look at them. They've got weapons. I just... I can't come up with a good reason why after they've been searched, as they're being detained, they clear their weapon, remove the magazine, prove that there's no round in the chamber, and then pick it up and carry it outside. Like, no, 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 you just, you leave it. Walking outside of the weapon when you're about to be detained is a surefire way to get shot. So I just, I don't know. These pictures just look a little bit off. Now, I try not to talk about myself very much here. I know it slips out from time to time, but I just feel like, there are so many more important things that we're covering. I don't want to waste your time with that. Uh, but if you're interested at all in my background and kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing today, uh, check out the interview I just did with Zachary Bell of the After Action Podcast. I'll put a link in the description below. Uh, it was about an hour and a half conversation. It was really fun chatting with Zach. He's also known as Veteran with a Sign. Does some really good work for our veterans. But we talked about you know the process of, of, of going through West Point, what life was like there. Uh, combat in Afghanistan, a little bit about the wars in Ukraine and Israel, and then kind of how I got into this line of work and some messages that I'm trying to convey as I'm doing this. But again, if interested, link is in the description below. Now, Hamas released a bunch of footage over the last couple of days. We'll run through some of it here. 
So the first one uh, was footage where Hamas says that their fighters exited a tunnel in Gaza, ambushed an Israeli outpost, and killed 10 Israeli soldiers. This footage, the way this is shot, kind of reminds me of the Islamic State style videos we were seeing from Iraq and Syria back 2015, 16 time frame, where Islamic State operatives and SDF to a degree would just like charge into some of these buildings and, and, and shoot people at point blank range. It kind of looks a lot like that. But this footage here, it shows one Israeli soldier that's in the outpost uh, that's shot and it kind of kind of cuts out, but it does look like Hamas tries to uh, drag the soldier's body away. And then at the end of the footage, they show at least some of the soldier's equipment that they were able to capture. Now, for all of the attention that tunnels got around Gaza right when this thing kicked off, we were really starting to see them play a major role in the ground combat operation. So, of course, the tunnels have been able to hide Hamas from the overall from the airstrikes, but now we're starting to see more and more where there's fighters emerging from those tunnels and, and ending up in direct fire engagement. So, in that last clip, it was roughly a squad size element that was able to sneak out and surprise an Israeli outpost in broad daylight, which is wild. Then we've got another look here where it looks like a tunnel entrance was discovered. Maybe a bulldozer plowed it up. They're doing a lot of that across Gaza. Uh, and then as soon as that opening appeared, a Hamas fighter began firing out of it towards Israeli forces. So the video shows the IDF firing back and eventually tossing a grenade into the tunnel, which appears to eliminate that threat. Hamas also put out some footage showing very close-range engagements with Israeli armor. This is sort of the standard Hamas footage right now. For a while there, the standard was like rockets firing off into the distance. Now it's a lot of these kind of tandem charge RPGs at very close range, sometimes inside of 10 meters, which is which is crazy close. Uh, the end of this video also shows some more Israeli gear, which appears to have been taken from a fallen IDF soldier. Then we've got Hamas showed a little bit uh, from inside one of their tunnels. Uh, as this clip goes on, they show they actually shot an Israeli dog that was sent in with what looks like a camera on its back. Uh, Israel also put out some footage showing dogs running around with cameras. The one from Israel looks like they're searching for IEDs or explosives, weapons cache, things like that. Um, but it looks like, based off this footage from Hamas, that Israel's also putting these dogs down into some of these tunnels with cameras doesn't look like they're probably designed to attack or anything like that, but more to map out the tunnel network ahead of Israeli forces moving down underneath. Now, the Houthis put out some footage the other day showing a pro-Palestinian rally in Sana, but I don't know. It, it looks fake, right? Something about this looks weird. It just doesn't quite look right. Uh, but what's not fake is the volume of drones and missiles that the Houthis have been launching like every day now for, for quite a while. So overnight, the USS Kearney, operated in the Red Sea, announced they had successfully engaged 14 drones launched from Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. Uh, the U.S. says that these were one-way attack drones or shot down with no damage to the ship uh, or any reported injuries. It's not entirely clear, again, if the target was the USS Kearney, other ships in the area, or if these were larger drones potentially headed for southern Israel. Now, if, if you think that you're losing track of all of the Houthi attacks in this area, that makes two of us. Uh, it's constant, multiple attacks a day. Uh, there's a couple quick graphics I wanted to show here to kind of give you an idea of just how much is happening in and around Yemen right now. So the first one here was put together by Damien Simon, who showed the location of all of the Houthi-initiated incidents in November and December. So this one calls out the various drone and missile attacks. Most of these were not one drone or one missile, but multiple munitions launched. It shows the location of the capture of the Galaxy Leader on November 19th, as well as the vessels that reported small Houthi craft approaching and in some areas attempting to board, and then those in other areas that were ordered to change course or risk being struck by Houthi drones or missiles. The second graphic here is kind of showing the international response in the area. So this was compiled by Intel Schizo on Twitter. And it shows a map. He does this regularly, updating uh, the, the naval presence in this region. It's really impressive work. Uh, but in this one, he shows a map of all of the warships in the Red Sea, the Gulf of Oman, Gulf of Aden, Persian Gulf, and the Arabian Sea. I mean, you've got naval vessels just in this small area from the U.S., China, United Kingdom, France, Spain, Japan, India. And there's probably some others that I'm missing. If I missed your country, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just a lot in a small area. Uh, the point is, it's it's a very crowded area with a lot of naval firepower. Now, some of these ships are there in task forces under kind of a counter-piracy mission to prevent 
things like the Galaxy Leader being taken uh, and hijacked. That's one type of mission that can be conducted. And, and technically, you could put enough naval vessels in an area to really reduce that from happening. Right? If the response time is fast enough, maybe you can stop it from happening entirely. It would take a heavy presence. But you know, when there's drones and missiles flying at military and commercial vessels in that area, that's a, that's a totally different mission set. Uh, so we'll see what this looks like going forward. It, it has largely been, exclusively been, defense at this point. But again, you see the volume of firepower in the region. If needed, there are plenty of assets that could strike Houthi targets in Yemen. But that's all I got for now. Of course, if interested in national security subjects, be sure to check out the sit reps I put out on Substack. Link is in the description below. But thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.